Good morning, church. Good morning. Good to have the choir getting us started this morning, isn't it? Amen. And on a sunny Sunday, too. What a beautiful weekend that we have had in Ohio. And so maybe it's fitting that we're going to open up in the way that we do with these two songs, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, and How Great Thou Art. If you remember from last Sunday, Andrew Higgins played a special piano piece for us, and it was Ode to Joy, or also known as Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. And so this Sunday, we wanted to sing it together, and and on a perfect sunny Sunday to sing about flowers blooming and all that. Got to warn you up front, too, the organ is broken. Dottie's played it too much. She wore it out there, so it, it'll be under repair this week there, but Dottie will be playing from the piano for us these opening hymns, Joyful, Joyful, as well as How Great Thou Art. As always, I invite you to stand and lift up your voices singing to Him. Amen? Stand as you're able.
Amen, church? Fitting song on a sunny weekend? Before you're seated with a sunny weekend with songs of Scripture in mind, with mountain grandeur and flowers blooming, I want you to turn around, find someone at least in the two pews away from you proximity, and ask them what their favorite aspect of God's creation is. Is it the flowers? Is it the mountains? Is it mowing the grass? Whatever it is, you ask a neighbor this morning before you're seated. then you may be seated. You may be seated. (laughs) Wigglies, we're going to leave you in for a moment longer because we've got one of your wigglies that's about to get wet. It's, It's an aspect of God's good creation where so much of the world is made up of water. It reminds us of what God wants to splash into our life. And often we do that at key stages in our Christian journey, either early on or coming to faith in Jesus Christ, as water is a symbol of of that greater splash of God in a life. And so church, I want to direct your attention to that pink insert that should be at the end of your pews, or if not, follow along. But we've got Chase and Leah today that want to take a meaningful step on behalf of their daughter, Abby, that we want to celebrate as a Christian family today. And so brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to remind you what baptism is about. It's through this act that we are brought into Christ's church. We're incorporated into God's saving activity in the universe, and we witness the new birth by water and the Spirit. It's this free gift that is the gift of God for all that have faith to receive it as a gift itself. And it's that gift that Chase and Leah want to enter into with Abby in mind. And so Chase and Leah, I want to ask you a series of questions about what kind of environment we're going to be raising Abby in and what we want to be the heartbeat of her young life together. Do the both of you believe in the triune God as revealed in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, say, I do. Do you repent of sin, rejecting Satan's influence on your life and desiring to die to sin and to live for Jesus? If so, say, I do. Do you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, identifying yourself with his death and resurrection and allowing him to run your life? If so, say, I do. Do you promise to serve Jesus' interests in the lives of people and to live as his disciple in union with his church? If so, say, I do. Will you therefore accept as your privilege and your responsibility to live before Abby a life that models God's love and the good news about Jesus until she professes personal faith in Christ as her Savior and is developed as a disciple of Jesus? If so, say, I will. And will you be careful that she be taught the truths of Holy Scripture, that she learn to worship God both publicly and privately in order that she may receive God's grace for herself? If so, say, I will. As we invite all families to do, and Chase and Leah have done, is to pick out a life verse, a a certain section of Scripture that they're going to remind their daughter of often as she goes throughout her growing and maturing process, and to point her back to a walking relationship with God. And so Chase and Leah have selected a verse from Philippians. I'm going to take. Uh, before we dive into this passage from Philippians, I wanted to look back at 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 3. Uh, here you can find the name Abigail, and she's described as a beautiful and discerning woman. And we uh, wanted to find a verse that highlighted these characteristics. So first, or, uh, Philippians for chapter 1, verse 9 through 11 reads, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more, with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Amen. Good verse. Good verse. It's with that verse in mind and the faith of your parents in mind, Abby, 
that we do what we're about to do next. She's splashing towards the water. She's ready for this, huh? Abby Packard, it's in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for this precious girl. Dear Lord, we thank you for this life of Abby, and we thank you for the faith expressed of her parents today. We just want to pray over that Philippians passage over this young life. What a quality prayer for their daughter, Lord that she may live in love, that she may grow in what it is, the knowledge and understanding of God. We would pray that for this girl at the start. May you be splashing that into her life as she remembers this day, the love of God pouring through her and the wisdom and the knowledge of God to guide and direct her. We pray this life would live for the glory of God, that through Jesus she understands some things about herself and her world And and ultimately what you saved her to, Lord, we just pray that that would take root at a young age for this girl. Even as she's leaning back and looking up to you, may that always be the posture of her life, Lord. And give Chase and Leah the wisdom and discernment as parents to direct her in that life. We thank you for a daughter that's reaching out to them even now, Lord. And we pray that doesn't leave her as they guide and direct her in this gamut of life. Thank you for Chase and Leah. Thank you for their journey and the invite of a friend and a neighbor who invited them to church and what you've been doing through their lives as a result of that. And we just pray through this church you would continue to minister to their whole family. We ask this even at Abby's baptism in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Abby, we got to get to be better friends there, huh? Bless you. (laughs) She's not allergic to the water for the record, okay? Congregation, it's not just Chase and Leah that make a commitment on this occasion. We commit on their behalf of of the kind of atmosphere we want in this place with them in mind as well. And so I'll direct your attention once again to that brochure and ask you as a congregation, do all of you accept the responsibility of assisting Leah and Chase in the fulfillment of these baptismal vows? Congregation, I commend to you, Abby, to your love and care. Will you live before her a life that models the good news of Jesus until she professes personal faith in Christ as Savior and is developed as a disciple of Jesus? Amen, church. Show your approval of this step of the pastor plan. And as the Packers are heading back to their seat, we're dismissing Wiggly worship for age-appropriate worship. For this service, it's any child ages 0 through 6th grade, ages 0 through 2, meet in that second classroom for, for nursery care and where they're played with and prayed for. All other age groups, ages 3 on through 6th grade, begin down in the fellowship hall for age-appropriate worship. And as we dismiss our Wigglies, we're going to invite our Wiggly worship director, Julie Jump, as well as my wife, to come forward and share a little update about how we can get involved in children's ministry of the church. And so, Julie, if you'd come forward. Julie got a round of applause in the first service there. I- I had to ask for it there, too, though. No, he's ridiculous. Okay. So I get up here every year, and it's not something I enjoy doing. It's asking for help. However, we need help, and that's a good problem to have. I'm going to be talking about different volunteering opportunities that we have with children and youth. Maybe you can just block me out if you can't stand children or youth because we don't want you back there if you don't like kids, okay? So just ignore me for a little bit. Take a nap. But for everyone else, if you do like children or youth, we have a spot for you back there in all of the different ministries that I'm going to go over. And again, um, 
for scheduling, I'm just telling you this out front, um, when we schedule you, um, it could be like for one hour out of one a month, per month, okay? Um, and we want it to, to fit your schedule. We do want it to be a commitment that you're committed to do this, but also it's flexible. We are very flexible with our hours and you can switch with different people, okay? Um, I don't know where the, oh, there we go, thank you. Um, I guess before I do that too, uh, just so we know, children and youth ministry, our goal, and I've said this many times if you haven't heard it, but our goal for all kids zero through 18 is for the kids to know, love, and follow Jesus through the good times and the bad times. That's our goal, okay, for them. So little Abby, she's in our nursery now, so she can grow up to know, love, and follow Jesus through good times and bad times because they're going to happen, right? So that's what we do back there, and I just want you to think, um, as I go through these different opportunities, think, how has God gifted me? How has he given me talents or a passion to work with different areas of kids and ministries to help them um, make an impact in the lives of these kids for eternity, okay? So let's just look through that. If you have your purple sheet, there's a purple sheet in your pew, I hope, or if not, there's lots of extras, so you can fill this out, um, and if not, you can think about it if you don't want to fill it out yet, but this is one area that we need, and that is nursery, and it is for zero to one or two-year-olds. We need help during both services for the nursery. Such a fun job that you get to hold babies, okay? We need help in the nursery, so you would check mark that box. Um, and pick the commitment level that you have. We really like once a month um, during both services, but if you only can do one, that's perfect. And the next is We Worship. That's during 1030. We have lots of preschoolers, which is awesome, right? But we do need more help in that area, as you can probably tell. So what we're hoping is to get more help in We Worship. So um, once a month, you're helping in that area. And so then the kids can go into groups of like five, and they can um, go to their different rotations as well. Next is Wiggly Worship. That's for kindergarten through fourth grade. Maybe you like working with kindergarten through fourth grade kids. This is just one group. They, we split them up into three groups, and they go through different stations each morning. Um, you would just check mark you like that age group. Maybe you're like, I don't like teaching. Well, guess what? We're not going to plug you in to teach, okay? Um, but maybe you like being a small group leader. You like just getting to talk to the kids and build relationships with them as they eat a snack. Or you just like, I can lead a craft. I can lead a game. And, and that's the area um, for Wiggly Worship. But you could also just be a walker. Not just, okay, that's important. You walk the kids to each station, and you're helping them out in that station. All right, that's Wiggly Worship. The next one is Wild Worship. I'm hoping for Wild Worship, depending on signups, that we'll have that for both services next year. Um, right now it's during 9 o'clock, but that's 5th and 6th graders. So if you like working with preteens, you would sign up for the Wild Worship. Next, well, okay, so all of those were for Sunday mornings. This is another opportunity. It's called GLOW. This is an after-school program we have at Bellevue Elementary School. So it's called GLOW because what we want is the kids to have a personal relationship with Jesus so they live their lives glowing for him, okay? So that's why it's called GLOW, but this is on Wednesdays. It does not start until the end of October, and it ends in the end of March. So you might be like, why in the world are you having me sign this form already? But it helps us know how many kids we can accept because we have signups in August, and last year we could only accept 48 kids. The year before, or a couple years before COVID, it was 96 kids, and it, it fills up like in an hour. So the sign up. So that just helps me know, and maybe you're like, I'm not sure. You can still check, check market and um, talk with me. So that is a fun way to be a missionary into the schools because some kids would never enter um, a church building, but they will go to the GLOW program. Game night vacation Bible school this year. If you've never helped and you want to kind of get into it, Vacation Bible School is definitely a place to help out. We have lots of fun that week. Crazy chaoticness, but it's awesome. We get lots of kids, and we need help. We can never have enough help for Vacation Bible School. So you can pick that area on your purple sheet. There, It, it will show different areas that you can sign up for. Um, if you like making crafts, you can be in the craft area. Like, There's all different areas, uh, again, for Game Night VBS. Next is youth ministry. So maybe you don't like babies, but you can talk to the senior girl about her boyfriend breaking up with her who's crying. Okay, there's so many different ones. There is not one area of these, and 
um, areas of ministry better than the other or more important than the other. Maybe you are with babies or maybe you are with those older kids. And for youth ministry, we do meet twice a month starting at, um, we'll meet all summer, but in September, a lot of your commitments don't start until September. Um, and maybe you say, I can't commit to twice a month. That's okay. We wouldn't make you a small group leader, but we would um, have you help with a game or, or with a, um, the meal, serving the meal. There's always a way that you can help. You just talk to me and we can personalize it to help fit your needs and how you can help serve because we, we need you. Uh, lastly, there's a summer donation board in the back that has post-it notes. If you don't, wouldn't mind, that's a huge help to us for summer. We have summer Wiggly Worship Camp, we have summer youth group, and we have um, our vacation Bible school. So these items just help us towards that. You just take an item or two and you go and purchase those items and you bring it underneath the board, and that's just a really huge help for us. So I hope you can consider filling out that purple sheet or pray through it and turn it in whenever you're ready. All right, I'm done. Wait, you got to clap for me. That's, he would say. I beg for clap too, but it doesn't happen there, huh? Boy. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so some needed areas, and, and, and as we've said before, to be a kid church, you, you need a lot of help in kids' lives. And so this is some of the ways that we can plug in. As long as we've got the heart to do it, there, there is a way that is needed and, and to help in that. And so see that purple form, be filling out that purple form, turn it in there, because there are areas to, to plug into people's lives and to pass faith to the next generation. Speaking of faith to the next generation, just some things to keep in mind full with summertime ahead. And that is that we won't be having wiggly worship on Sundays unless you're of the preschool age groups. We will still have some child care for nursery and preschool age groups, but Wiggly Worship is moving to Wednesdays during the summer. We've done that the last couple summers, and it's worked well. You just have more time into kids' lives and a little bit more flexible scheduling. And so for Wiggly Worship in summertime, it will be Wednesdays from 10 until 11.15. This also helps us give our volunteers, many of them, a summer off too. And so there's added benefit around the board with that in mind. So Wiggly Worship, Wednesdays, 10 to 11.15 for our school age, grades K through, through fifth grade. You do need to register for Wiggly Worship camps. And so you can get that information in the bulletin or also post it on the walls there in the hallways of the church. But how to register would be that website for Wiggly Worship camps. Also for the upper age groups, grades 6 through 12, we're doing it on Wednesdays right after that. It's over the lunchtime from 11.45 until 1 o'clock, and lunch will be provided as a part of that. You don't need to register for that, but it is helpful to have some pre-registration. Kids are always welcomed and invited to bring their friends for this as well, but just a rough estimate is helpful for food prep purposes. So Wiggly Wednesdays. For young kids, as, as well as older kids, two different times, but similar dates and more information about that in the bulletin just so that you can start to make your summer plans accordingly. And then these two individuals, Gary and Tammy Wiley, are members of the church there. They did not realize prior to this that their picture would be up there, but they had a meaningful moment this week, this past weekend, as they had a grand opening for their business, which would be Cherry City, the honey farm just outside of town on Northwest Road. And so they had a ribbon cutting ceremony just this past weekend. A state representative was there to congratulate them as well. And just in case you needed their photos blown up a little bit more, they're the bee people. And so we're, we're pleased that, that Rick and Tammy had a big opening and a key moment for, for their business with the grand opening there. We want to continue to worship at this time. And I want to invite you to stand as you're able and let's lift up our voices to him. Oh 
Amen, church? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We have simply, as just a reminder of how great our God is, been going through His good book to us. And in the course of 2022, we're going to ch- complete the, the Gospel of John from, from cover to cover as a part of our Sunday morning service. And so a different member of the congregation has just been reading a chunk of the Gospel of John each and every week that we've gathered to worship. And today we're pleased to have Dream of Phillips. He usually sits in the balcony front and center this week there. And so Dream, if you would lead us in the Word of God today. Sorry, I'm a little shorter here. (laughs) Good morning, my name is Dreema Phillips. Um, Most of you know me through my parents who are members here, Al, or Diana and the late Al Spohr. I first started attending about 16 years ago. Um, My husband, Ed, son Cohen and daughter Ashlyn, and I love coming here to this church because of the truly kind, heartfelt people here the inspiration we receive weekly to live by the Bible and grow in our relationship with God and the wonderful, amazing children's program that, as Julie mentioned, is here. This church family has helped me and my family in more ways than I can count. Uh, This morning I am reading from the New Living Translation Bible John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, Even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then people took the loaves. Then Jesus took the loaves gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 loaves or 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. This is the word of God. True that. Thank you, Dreema. Thank you. And and not always does the scripture patches tie into the sermon, and yet this week it will loosely. Jesus has done it again. 5,000 people listening to his teaching, they're hungry, and he takes five loaves and two fish and feeds the crowd with it. That ties into how God's created us, not just for bread alone, not just for fish sandwiches, but for something else that's the scriptures, which is the series that we've been in for the last couple weeks together. So I will remind you, church, we're in the midst of a sermon series about how to understand this book known as the Bible. What is the Bible? What's its place in our life? And how do we get in this book in a way that is the needed nourishment for life that God has designed us? And so a couple weeks back, we, we launched off with this by dealing what inspiration of Scripture is. What does it mean when a Christian says that the Bible is the inspired Word of God? 
And we've heard of other sacred stories, the Koran, the Book of Mormon, the Vedas, different world religions have their own word of God. What, what is it that makes the Bible different than those other books? What does a Christian mean when they say this isn't just a good book, but the God book? We, we talked about that a number of weeks back as it related to, to understanding the Bible. And then, and then we understand the plot line of Scripture. From creation to fall to rescue to reunion. You, you want to do it, don't you? We, we won't do our exercises for time's sake today, but, but we know the storyline from Scripture of creation, fall, rescue, and reunion, and how that plot moves the passages forward and giving the point and the understanding. We talked about that a number of weeks back. And then last week we began part one of getting in the kitchen understanding God's word and, and how do we prep this cuisine that God has given us in the context of scripture. And so I will remind you from last week that we dealt with this passage. This is why it, say I, it ties into what Dreamer just read a moment ago. Because Jesus would say as a part of his temptation narrative, he cites scripture to remind us of scripture's value in our life. Jesus says, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, not that there's no place for bread, but, but not bread just alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's the passage we'll look at yet again this week. So read it one more time with me. Matthew 4, 4. Let's read it together, church. But he, that is Jesus, answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is Jesus who's saying this. That same one who fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. Jesus knows the importance of bread, right? This is the one that did a miracle with five loaves and two fishes. He knows physical creatures need physical food, but not just physical food, not just bread alone. And so that's why he pairs this passage with bread alone, with this need of some other sustenance, some other sustainment, the scriptures themselves. We need every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so as I said last week, that I'll remind you of this week, without this book, you will starve. Or you will stall in your walk and relationship with God. We need this book. Just as physical creatures need physical sustenance, if we're to go anywhere and grow in our walk and relationship with God, then we need the nutrient that is contained in that book. And so as we started last week is, how do we get in this book? Some, some recipe for success about how to understand this book and some tips from the kitchen that I've just picked up on in two plus decades in this book that I'm just trying to pass along to help us get in the book or grow further in this, this study of God's Word together. And so I'll remind you, what we began with last week is the recipe for success with this book. That is that we need to come hungry. We, we need to come with an expectation that this is God's word and God speaks to it into my life. And so we come with this wanting and this desire, this hunger to hear from God through this book. We got to check the ingredients, the importance of context with this book, because there have been some in the church and outside the church that have abused that book before. You can make the Bible mean whatever you want it to mean, and that would be the wrong meaning. We want this to be God's word, not my word that I'm forcing God's word to speak into. And the only way to do that is to do the, the contextual work needed to hear from God rather than to hear what my voice has put into it. There's some tools for the trade in the kitchen, and that's what we're focusing on today. What are some, some tools for the kitchen that's going to help us get into God's word? And then we've got to remember we've got to combine it together. God's timeless truth really is timeless which means it's just as relevant in the year 2022 as it's ever been. And so we've got to combine what is truth said in that day for how it applies to our day today, and then we've got to consume it. That is to not just hear God's word, but do God's word. God's word isn't just there to, to make you smarter. It's there to, to change your life and orient you in his direction. And so how do we live into that? That's the recipe. Now here's the tips that we were gleaning from the kitchen from last week. We approach this book with prayer. Because it's a divine book, we need divine help to understand it. And so we ask God, God, help me to understand your book. we we got to start chewing off whole sections of Scripture. There's a time in our growth and early on where we need vitamins, right? Flintstones, they're, they're tasty and they're nutritious. But, but as we journey, we don't want our only experience for nutrient and vitamin to be the Flintstones, right? Because there's a Thanksgiving feast that needs to be spread. We, we want to sink our teeth into that someday. And much the same way with Scripture. Devotions 
are those Flintstone vitamins. They help you. They nourish you. They give you some, some needed growth in the faith there. But eventually we want to come to a day where we're, we're reading God's word for God's word, sinking our teeth into what does Romans say or the book of Genesis, gnawing on that for a little while there. It grows us and matures us in the faith. And so those are some helpful places to start with that whole foods in mind. Last week we talked about the value of knowing the whole story. That's been part of my life journey with the book, of the value of reading it from Genesis to Revelation and, and doing that regularly just helps give you that bigger picture perspective about where God's plot line's moving along. But however we read it, sometimes we need to read it slowly. And this is that big seminary takeaway that's going to save you three to four years of your life and thousands of dollars, right? If, if you just read the book slowly, word for word, phrase by phrase, and think about what God is revealing through that phrase, that's a tip in the kitchen that will help you in Scripture. Always have on the back of your mind two questions whenever you're approaching a passage of Scripture, and that is, what does it say about God? And what does it say about me, my, myself, or the world that I live in, society at large? What does it say about God, and what does it say about me as we're thinking through Scripture helps us to unlock what, what Scripture is meaning and apply it for our lives. And then the value of a good translation. I advocated King James Version probably isn't for most of us unless you read Shakespeare regularly or really dive into Beowulf. That's your book there. If, if that's not your genre, then you should probably be reading the NIV or NLT because while God's truths are timeless, language always changes. And so if you're using the language from 1611 King James Version, then I better see you walking down the street saying, these and thou's, how art thou? And none of you speak to me that way. So you'd probably be more with an updated language like the NIV and NLT. Timeless truths, but, but in today's language with that in mind. And then lastly, we closed with this question. When confused, come back to the canon. That is that there are some confusing sections in Scripture, and the way to help us understand those confusing sections is we've got to let the Bible help us understand the Bible. Go back to the canon of Scripture itself. That, that's where we left you off last week, and I want to move you forward to seven more tips from the kitchen real quick. Seven more things I think will just help us unpack this grocery store of a gamut that God has got in His Word. And before we launch into that new direction, I, I do want to say... Part of my fear as I've been going through the sermon series is I hope that I've not come across with, with too much information that gives you to the point where you're like, must take a professional to understand this book. Because this is a lot of information, this is a lot that he's thrown at us. And, and if I've given that impression, press delete, okay? This book is for you. This book is not for professional preachers and missionaries or just people in full-time ministry. This book is for everyone. It's the Word of God for the people of God. That's factories, that's stay-at-home moms, that's principals, that's presidents. This book is for all of us. There, there was a time in church history where the church gave the impression that you had to be a pro to understand the book. And they put plenty of obstacles in the place from keeping the people from understanding the book because there's an agenda behind that. And so the book was written in Latin. They didn't want it translated in the masses of other languages, because if you keep it in the language that only the elites know, then not everyone knows the power that's in this book. And so they purposely tried to keep it that way. And there were people that came along, people like the, the ranks of John Wycliffe and William Tyndale and Martin Luther that said, no, this book is for everyone, and so we need to get this in as many languages as possible so that they get God's truth that's translatable in every language. And so William Tyndale was one of those men that gave his life for this cause that said this. In a time in church history in the medieval period, he said, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause the boy that plows, that dries the plow to know more of the scriptures than you. What's Tyndale getting at in that quote except to say that the plowman can know just as much of God's truth than the Pope can? And he was all about getting the plowman, that word, in his native tongue in that way. This book is for all of us. This book is for all of us, and it is to nourish you, to, to grow you, to help you to go in your walk with God, places that you will never get at trying to do it in your own strength. You need this nutrient. You don't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so this Bible is our bread that helps move us along in this journey of God. We, we need it. And so please hear all of these tips from the kitchen as to just try to help you take that step further into preparing more God's word and the cuisine he's cooked up for you. And if this book is new for us, 
I mean, how do you start in the kitchen? Scrambled eggs, right? It's just crack something open, one ingredient, let's stir along. I don't know what of these 14 points is your one ingredient, but you start there. And if you've been scrambling eggs for a while, then maybe it's time to try Eggs Benedict or, or a step up. You, know, you get the point there? And so wherever you're at in this journey, you start where you're at and then let's grow and let's get deeper. And so hopefully these 14 tips are just some help through the decades of, of ways that, that might get you deeper into God's word to prepare the meal, the feast that God has graciously given us through his book. And so let me give you seven more, okay? One of those, piggybacking off last week, what do we do with the tough texts? How do we troubleshoot the tough texts in Scripture? 70% of the Bible, and yes, all statistics are made up on the spot, okay? But 70% of the Bible is easy to understand. Their stories, their narrative, you can understand a shepherd boy slinging a stone that hits a Goliath and chomples him down. Like, like that's easy to understand. We get the flow of that narrative. But there are sections of Scripture that will take a little bit more work or that seem to be sending mixed messages. It says it here in this way, but it's played out differently in this way. What do you do when there's mixed messages in Scripture itself? Well, well let me give you three things. What, what's behind these? First of these, when the plain sense makes sense, do it hence. <laughs> there's a lot of Scripture that just makes sense. What we don't want to do is do what it actually says. And what I'm saying there, if it makes sense, you do it. It, this book's not to just be heard, but to be obeyed. So when the plain sense makes sense, do it. Do it hence there. But what do you do when it's troubling? you got to go to step two. In the complex, think context. And that is like grammatical context. What does this word mean? How, how do you define it? How does this word equate to the greater phrase or the sentence structure? The passage itself, that's grammatical context. Historical context, what's their historical setting? Why are they having to write to this issue? What, what's going on historically that's going to help me understand this passage? Canonical context, that's, that's how does this passage fit in the greater storyline of the Bible itself? That will help us understand it. Literary context ties in with grammatical context, the words themselves, and the literary arrangement. When, when we're confused by something, we've got to go back to the context and do some digging at times, which lets us to that third principle, let the Bible help you interpret the Bible. These are helpful principles, but, but they're principles. And so let me illustrate it with a, a specific issue in the church a, a, of a different decade there. We, we've dealt with some powder keg issues in the sermon series. Talked about human sexuality a couple weeks back, and so why not bring up the issue of women in ministry this week, huh? Shall, shall we do that there? Women in ministry, and what's the take on women in ministry, and, and what's the Bible say about women in ministry? If, if you're connected to church life, some of you are laughing. You're like, uh-oh, where's this going to go there and all this there? If you've been connected to church for any length of time, you, you know there are certain dom- denominations that will ordain women to pastoral ministry and certain that will not. The Methodist Church is a denomination that will ordain women in ministry. They, they can be your pastor, and we've had pastors, pastors prior that have been women. Other denominations, you can't. Catholics, some, some, some Baptists, non-denominational, that will not ordain women in ministry. And so how does all this go down? Can I first say, first and foremost, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. You catch what I'm doing, right? Saying the Apostles' Creed, that core of the Christian faith that a Methodist will adhere to, that a Catholic will adhere to, that a Lutheran will adhere to, that a Baptist will adhere to. Like, there are some matters in the Christian faith that are non-negotiable, that is what it is to be a Christian that all Christians, all ages have agreed to, it's preserved in the creed. There are some other matters that Methodists see differently than Baptists, that see differently than Catholics, that, that are still under the umbrella of Christianity, but is a realm to agree to disagree upon. And that's the realm we're dealing with with women in ministry. Say, why is there some agreement to disagreement if you're working from the same book? Well, let me illustrate with these three principles in mind. There's a passage in Scripture that says this. Not the only passage, but a passage that's brought up often in this debate there. 1 Corinthians 14. Women should remain silent in the churches. All the men said, don't say anything. You're in trouble, huh? (laughs) Women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home, 
for it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. It's in the book. It's, it's there. And obviously we've broken that today, right? My, my wife gave an announcement about children's ministry. Dottie and Kathy have led us in some worship music. Dreama just read the scripture passage. They clearly weren't being silent in the churches. So what's gone down in this passage? And, and why do we do this differently? Because the plain sense meaning seems to be that women are to be silent. But, but where we have to take this is the gamut of what's all of scripture say about womanhood and involvement in the churches. Because there are times that this seems to be a mixed message. This is where we got to dig into context. Whenever there's a confusing point there or an alarming point, you got to think context. And the context behind 1 Corinthians 14, this immediate passage, has to do with some disorder that's going on in the Corinthian church. People are showing up to church in Corinth, and it's just chaos. And everyone's speaking out of turn, and, and there's no common communal worship that's taking place because there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this, and, and it's disorderly. And so Paul in this passage is dealing with some orderly times of what we need to do so that the community can worship together. And, and I venture one of those odd phrases in this is that a woman should ask her husband at home. Well, well maybe some of the, the historical cultural framework that Paul's dealing with here is that in the day of Corinth, Women weren't the educated masses of society. Men were. This is not right or wrong. This is just the context that he's dealing with. And so maybe part of the interruption and disorder was women asking questions that that could have been answered or not laughed at by the group if if she just saved it for for lunchtime rather than mid-sermon shouting out her question or comment. That that might be part of that. That's what some scholars argue is part of the reason why they're asking women to ask their husband at home. Larger context than just 1 Corinthians 14. There's disorder that's taking place in Corinth, but larger context, we should be asking questions because before chapter 14, there was 1 Corinthians 11 that said this, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It's the same as having her head shaved. So he's dealing with something else with head coverings, but he's saying in this passage that a woman who prays or prophesies Like what's taking place in Corinth is that there's women in ministry. They're leading prayers. They're prophesying. They're preaching at times there. And Paul doesn't seem to take offense to this here. He's dealing with another issue that he deals with it later on with disorder in worship. So even in the larger context of that book, you see that there's women's involvement in some way in the ministry that's taking place in Corinth that Paul's dealing with. Trouble that with an even larger context. Paul, not to the letter in Corinth, but in other churches he writes letters to, he praises women for their involvement and their leadership in certain local churches. Priscilla and Aquila, maybe some famous names in the Bible. It's actually, Priscilla is is the woman's name. It's very unlikely that you put a woman's name before the man's name in Paul's day and age. But he's writing to Priscilla and Aquila, who are used to teach Apollos another big figure in the early church, and he's praising them for their teaching. Not not being silent, but passing on the faith to another church leader. And so when when the the gospel message, when when the Bible is sending mixed messages, and and I say mixed messages, it's seamless message there, but it might seem from appearance as a mixed message, you got to see all the context in mind, including with how the Bible begins. Remember Genesis, when human beings are first introduced? It says, God says, let us make mankind in our image. In the image of God, he created them, male and... There, there wasn't a male, yes, female, no. It was both male and female as image bearers of, of, of the God who was making them. So you, you got to read the full gamut of the book there, I think, to understand why the reason why the Methodist church has taken the church. Easter wasn't that long ago even. One last point with that, right? Easter wasn't that long ago. Jesus rises from the dead. He gives a message to the first witnesses who were what gender? And he tells them to tell the the boys, right? I got a message for you. Go tell the disciples that I've risen from the dead. Proclaim the message of the resurrection. And he gives that task to the women. 
So whenever there's something in Scripture that, that says something shocking but doesn't quite jive with the rest of the gamut of Scripture, there's where we got to do those troubleshooting of the tough texts and those three principles in mind. There are some issues that are consistent in the Old Testament, consistent in the New Testament, and we want to say are inconsistent today. That's not what I'm referring to. When there is a consistent message in Scripture on something, then our act is to do it hence, not to find a way around that. But there are some messages in Scripture that aren't quite consistent throughout, and there's where we have to do some extra digging. Why is this not consistent? What's the backstory or the context behind that's making this in that way? And women in ministry seems to be one of those examples. So principles there with an illustration. Let's give you some more cutlery in the kitchen. Number nine, get a good study Bible. A good study Bible. I, I advocated last week with a translation of a Bible. The NIV or NLT are usually easily readable translations. A study Bible is made in those translations, but what it does is on the top part, it has the biblical text. This is the Word of God, the actual biblical text itself. But what it has in addition to the Word of God is, is someone's notes on those verses. Might give some historical background context there or some historical cues or help you see some things literarily. It's written by a scholar. It's written by a, a godly person, but it's not God's word. And it's a helpful study note that might help us along, especially in some troubling sections of Scripture. And then there's other aids there. It might introduce a book of the Bible or give you an outline of the book of the Bible that can be helpful. But a good study Bible can really help you along, especially if reading through the Bible is new to you. And so the NLT or NIV both have life application Bibles or study Bibles that I would advocate to get a good one and to help you move you along there. Number 10, commentaries can be helpful. Commentaries are like study Bibles on steroids, okay? So a study Bible might give a little footnote version of a given verse. A, a commentary writes a whole book on a biblical book. They can be pricey and expensive, and so what I would say to you is don't buy them, borrow mine, okay? So if you're studying through the book of Romans or something, on my bottom shelf in my office, I've got a whole bookshelf of commentaries, two different commentary series that you're welcome to use and to borrow. Just let me know because I do use them at times, and so I want to be able to track them down if I have use of them. But it can just give you some added background or some historical background that might be helpful. If you are wanting to invest on one in your own, um, the Moody Bible commentaries a number of years back gave a single volume commentary, and so it gives little nuggets throughout all 66 books of the Bible. That might be helpful. I I've never used that myself, but, but my mother got that book a couple years back, and she's found it helpful, and so I kind of give that on her whim there in that way. That, that might be a succinct commentary, but more lengthier ones that can be found on my office that, that can just give you some background of the Bible story itself especially when with confusing passages. This is something I do regularly. This word studies, commentaries, I use maybe 50% of the times in sermon prep. If there's a passage that I'm really confused about, I might consort it, but by and large, I don't use them in a week in, week out, and I certainly don't in my private devotional time. But this I do regularly, and it's word studies. Back in the old days, 10 years ago, when I was in seminary, they used to drop this book called a lexicon on our laps there. And it's, it's just a big book there. It's got the words there. This one's a Greek lexicon. You'd have to get one for Hebrew as well for the Old Testament words there. But it's just a list of every word in the Bible there and looking it up, the cross references to that. And so you, you just got to use this like you'd use a dictionary for Webster's or something like that. Easier resource for us website called blueletterbible.com. This hasn't been open since seminary, just confessing, okay? But, but I use this site weekly because it's a free resource. You, you can get a, a, a bigger resource like Logos Bible software, but probably unneeded. This will, this will help you do much of what you need to do at this level, but you can do word studies. So that reference is in your message outline. I would advocate it. What you do, if you're familiar with Google, you can be familiar with this. There's a search bar that you can just type whatever passage that you're looking into. So I did this last week. Matthew 4.4 4 was our passage. I typed in Matthew 4, and it took me to this page here. I, I can 
try to blow this up or, or just stop by the office this week if you want to walk through this. I thought the print was going to be a little bit larger than what it is. But what you need to know is once you type in a passage, there's a tools tab that if you click on will give you a whole study for a given word or a given passage. So Matthew 4, 4 is the passage I typed in. I click tools and it drops every word in Greek, the original text and how it's translated in English. If you click on the link right next to the Greek word, it's going to give you every instance that word is used in the New Testament or if you're doing it for Hebrew in the Old Testament. It's going to give you every instance. And so what you can do is read through those verses that use that word that will help give you an understanding of what that word really means in the biblical usage of it. And so it can be really valuable to dive in deep with the passage in this way to do that. So what I did last week with this, there's the word that Jesus said, man will not live on bread alone. I wanted to find out, Jesus, are you talking about just bread, bread? Or are you saying bread is like food? Is this word specifically only referred to bread, bread? Or is this, you don't live on food alone? So I clicked on that word, and, and in the, the, the dictionary usage, it's often used, yes, as bread, bread, but it has a bigger meaning of food in general. And so Jesus is not making a gluten-free statement or to do gluten in the statement. He's talking about food and the physical body's need for nourishment. This is food he's referring to, and as he's comparing it to Scripture, our need for, for consuming God's Word. And so it's not just bread, bread. That helps bring about that meaning for me, for that word usage. So Blue Letter Bible, helpful reference. There's more that could be said about that, but we won't say it for time's sake today. Point number 12. This is another one to gold star. I, I will tell you, if you take away nothing of these 14 tips, you need to pray, you need to chew off whole books of the Bible, and the number three on my list that I really want you to, to jot down is this one. There's, there's another website called The Bible Project. If you're in our year-long Bible study, we use this monthly as a part of it. On certain times in worship on Sunday, we'll pull out a video from the Bible Project to use to this. Mark and Jane Motley were two students that took the year-long Bible study about six years back when we last offered it, and they introduced me to this. I had never known of it until they passed it along forward to me. Great site that gives you large overviews of biblical books or biblical themes. And so it's called The Bible Project. You can Google it or just type in Bible Project and it'll take you to this site. There's a tab at the top of this site that's called Videos. Click on that and it'll give you video libraries. The one that I use most often is Overviews on Biblical Books. And so every book of the Bible, there's 66 of these videos. Every book of the Bible has a broad overview book. And so what I advocate to you to do is when you study Scripture, hey, I want to read the book of Genesis. What I would tell you to do is go to the Bible Project, click on the Genesis video. It'll be about 10 minutes long. It's going to show you from Genesis 1 to Genesis 50 what this book is about. And then read the book yourself. You ever go to a movie and you just want to know what the synopsis is before you get into the movie? Because it's going to help you understand the movie a little bit more. You don't do that if you want a spoiler alert, okay? But, but, but if you're wanting to preview a movie before seeing it, you might do that. that that's like what this is. It's going to help you get more out of the movie that you're seeing because you know how it begins and you know how it ends and you know the key turning points within it. And so I, I would advocate this site there. Ten-minute videos for each biblical book, though, but it'll help you give a bigger understanding. Watch it before, watch it after reading. It'll just help give you the perspective of what, what you've read through in that way, especially leading in and beginning in a book. Point number 13. That just sounds intimidating, doesn't it? <laughs> Point number 13. Just two more, okay? This one will be quick. Read it or audio it. Read God's Word or listen to God's Word. I, I know one of the things that keeps some of us back from God's Word is we just say we're too busy. And, and I'm not even going to challenge that pushback, but I'm just going to say, is there a pocket of time that maybe you can't sit down before the book, but that you're commuting to work? or you're dropping your son and daughter off for the 15th Little League practice this week, and so you're in the car in this way? Like, like, what is a pocket of time where you can just listen to God's Word then as you're going along? Working out, whatever it is there. How, how do we listen to God's Word? Because we know that God's Word is our needed nourishment for our journey with God. And so it's our task of how do I get the nourishment in the system? And, and reading it for many of us in a literate culture is helpful. 
I find it helpful to read it. I, I need the black and white before me, and it helps me go slowly and see some things. But audioing it isn't a cop-out version. As a matter of fact, for the first 1,500 years of the church, the major way to access God's Word was through listening to it. The print and press wasn't invented. Gutenberg didn't do the movable type yet there. And so the only way that we had access to mass copies was to hear it read in public reading kind of settings there, to, to do God's Word into it. And so there's no cop-out and listen to it. And today in the year 2022, we've got a lot of different ways that we can access listening to it. The U version is a Bible app that I have on my phone. And, and as a mo- part of that there, the U version Bible app, you, you can click on that and there's some audio features within that app where you pick the passage of Scripture and it'll just read it for you, even in different voices. My voice isn't one of those voice options on that, fortunately, there. But, but there's different voices that you can have for that there. And so the, the U version might be a helpful way to listen to it. They still make CD translations or MP3 downloads there. And so I just advocate that there's sources out there to listen to it if this is the way to get us introduced into, into God's Word and that needed nourishment of life. Last point here, okay? For the record, I think 14 points is the record for us here. So last point here is is that the person is the purpose, not the page. In reading God's word, don't get lost that the point behind all this is getting to know this God who made you, this God who designed life and genuinely knows how life works best, what works and what doesn't work. It's getting to grow closer to him and this walking relationship with him. What if I told you, Ju- Julie and I have been dating and married for, for, for decades now. What if I told you, and in those dating and marriage years, she's, she's written some notes and some letters to me and some cards to me through the years that I've kept and saved. What if I told you that every single night before I go to bed that I just kiss that letter? And at times where we're at the dinner table together, um, I'll ask my family, who wants to go for a walk around the block with me? And all their hands shoot up, but I say, no, that's okay. I'm just going to pull this wagon filled with letters around the block. Like, what would you think of me if I said that, huh? You'd think, what kind of wacko is this guy, right? He's missing the point that those letters are behind a life there. That his relationship, his marriage is to a wife, not, not, not just some personal letter to kiss and smooch and walk around. What's going on with that? And I would say the same thing to you. If, if you miss the point that the Bible is just about some book knowledge, if you didn't know some cool trivia that took place centuries ago there, or something like that, like, you, you miss the point of the book. You miss the point of the book. Th- this book is God's love letter to you. And he's revealing some stuff about himself so that you will connect to him in an eternal relationship with him. Letters help bridge the distance at times. And that's what this is helping us do as we navigate our journey of earth. Jesus had this reprimand to some people in his day that mastered the book but wanted nothing to do with the being behind the book. He said this, You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. The scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. He's saying to his generation, you've missed the point of the book. It was to introduce you to the love of your life. I'm standing right here before me, and you just want that. This book, in the meantime, is our way to him. But never lose sight that your walk and your relationship isn't to some trivia pieces. It's to a being behind it all. And so the purpose of this book is the person, not the page. Helpful tips in the kitchen helps us get into this book. What we will do next week And I failed to say this earlier on in the service, and so if you have these, by all means, you can fill it out. Next week is going to be a question and answer segment based off these that have already been filled out. Or if you have a personal question that hasn't been asked, fill one of these out. It may come up as a part of the Q&A next week. There's a chance, even though I do preach like 50 minutes there, that we won't have enough time to cover all of these. And so if you write your name to it, I I will be sure to respond to you either through email or a personal conversation of whatever you put on this, if you put your name to it. If you don't put your name to it, obviously I won't be able to track it down if I can't answer it as a part of the Q&A next week. But if you got a question about understanding God's word, maybe something that we cover that you'd like more in depth about, fill this out, turn it in the offering plate, and that will be our sermon guide for next week as we close off this series. Let me close this off today in a word of prayer, though. 
Let's pray together, church family. Lord, we do thank you for the book. How lost we would be in life if we didn't have that guidance from the book, Lord. You teach us what's right and wrong in that book. You remind us that that even though that we are prone to wrong, that you haven't given up on us and you've got a way forward, a forgiving of the past and a freeing to move about differently because of this book. We thank you for that, Lord. But we pray most of all what this book is doing is reminding us that there's a person behind these pages, that he's inviting us, he's winning us, he's wooing us into an eternity with him. Lord, help us to meet him, to fall for him, to follow him in the ways that genuinely lead to life everlasting. We're praying that even as we study this book together. In Jesus' name. And his people said, Amen. 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 Stand as you're able. Let's receive this benediction. We got some congratulations to give following the service. Be sure to track down Chase and Leah, congratulating them for this meaningful step. But as always, when we leave this place, we want to go following Jesus. And so it's with that in mind that you are dismissed. Amen?